Welcome to Behind the Music, the Houston Chamber Choir's weekly podcast. I'm Sinjin Flynn. This time, I'm joined by one of the Houston Chamber Choir basses, Patrick Snyder. Patrick, thank you very much for joining us. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to do this. How long have you been singing with the Houston Chamber Choir, Patrick? Uh, four years. Four years. Four years now. Yeah. So this would, this would be, I think, season five. And what was it that made you want to audition for the choir? Um, well, I had kind of heard that it was kind of the, the choral group to, to be in, in Houston. And I had recently um, graduated from, from UH um, with a vocal performance um, master's degree. And um, I kind of decided I wanted to, to get more in, back into choral singing. That was kind of the way that I uh, first really fell in love with music and decided I wanted to pursue it, you know. And um, I, was, I was pursuing opera more and more throughout my schooling, but was kind of ready to do something different when I graduated. And I felt like the universe was maybe pushing me in that direction a little bit. Um, and so I kind of bugged Bob until he gave me an audition. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> he, had a, he happened to have an opening, so it worked out, yeah. So what is it that you enjoy about being part of the choir? Um, well, that it's so good, I guess. I mean, not to, not to put too fine a point on it, but I think that... Um, yeah, I I have a real soft spot for for like really um, well done choral music and uh, to kind of get to do that and participate in that and and be in rehearsal going like yeah this is good this is really nice um, there's something really special about that I mean that's leaving aside like the camaraderie and just you know how much fun it is. Um, but I think for me, what, what makes it truly special is that, um, you know, the, it, it just it just sounds good. It coming kind of coming back at you, and that I mean, that's just it fills me with with joy. Any particular highlights from the repertoire that that you have sung? Any particular favorites? Well, I think the experience that will always kind of stick in my brain forever is. Um, the, the very first time that I uh, was in a rehearsal with the chamber choir. Um, and uh, we, we pulled out Durafle Requiem because we were doing the, the complete works of Durafle for our first concert, which is the album that, that won the Grammy. Um, mm -hmm. So that was, a, that was a good first one. And uh, I, had, I, I knew the piece and um, I well I, I mean I know it better now but I but I knew it fairly well and um that that first movement saying you know we, we started off I think with the with the Requiem Eternam the, the very first movement you know we hadn't even gotten to the point of really finessing it yet but it still just was absolutely I mean it, it was it was a life-changing experience I just I hadn't I hadn't ever been in a choir that good before and I and it had been yeah, I, it, yeah, it was it was emotional for me. It's hard hard to put into words, but it was it was really really magnificent. And then later that year, we did we did on um, the Bach B minor Mass, and that w was also um, a heck of an experience. I think I can't remember if it was last year or the year before. I think it was last year we did um, the Unicorn, the the Manticore, and the Gorgon. I'm, I'm getting the order of those wrong. The Unicorn, the Gorgon, and the Manticore, maybe by. Mm -hmm. by Minotti and mm -hmm. um, uh, we collaborated with a with a local um, dance organization for for that performance and um, yeah I mean that that's something I've not ever really even seen done before let, let alone been a part of um, mm -hmm. and the music is very cool and the performance was just was really cool and we didn't get to rehearse with them a, a whole lot before the performance you know it was like a you know kind of the week of sort of deal and and so just even in the performance itself you're still kind of noticing the dancers and what they're doing and how they're sort of um commenting on the on the text of the piece 
uh, in their in their in their dancing while we're performing it. So that that was <laughs> that was really cool. It was a really cool experience. And then last season, um, one that I one that I really enjoyed was the concert by local, um, where we um, did did some pieces by some local composers that I know. Um, my friend mm -hmm. uh, Mark Buller and Daniel Mags, we did pieces by them, which, um, I mean, it's just so not, it's so cool to be able to, to do, do pieces by people. They're like, oh yeah, I went to, went to school with that guy. And oh yeah, I sang with, <laughs> sang with that guy at, at church the other day, you know? And then um, David Ashley White, obviously, was heavily involved at, at Moore School of Music for such a long time. So I, I know who, knew who he was. And um, yeah, that, that, that was really special. I, I really enjoy kind of getting to, to perform works with the composer right there. There's something really thrilling about that, so. But you've also sung some solos with the choir. Yeah, I have. Uh, I did the, the, the bass solo in the, in the Bach B minor mass. That was a challenge. That was a hard one. Um, but it was cool to get to learn that piece because I, 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 I previously knew the, the Etten Spiritum Sanctum solo um so i was kind of thinking in my head you know if i do a solo in the b minor mass it's probably going to be that one um right. but, but bob ended up um, having ramin my friend and baritone cohort do that one and um asked me to do oh boy i can't i can't remember what it's called but it's the it, it's it's <laughs> lower which is not really where i'm used to sitting i guess and um mm -hmm. so that was yeah that was a, a fun challenge and how's it been to sing outside of the classical repertoire? Um, some of the uh, the works that you sang with, with Kim Nazarian, for example. Oh, I had a blast. I think I have a harder time singing that stuff. And I'm not really sure why, because I listen to that kind of music far more than I listen to classical music. Um, and I love it. I, I really enjoy it. But for some reason, it's just, I mean, maybe it's just my experience in singing and the fact that I sing in church so much and whatnot. It just doesn't, I feel like I have to work harder at it. It doesn't, it doesn't come as automatically, I guess. But, um, but yeah, that concert was, that concert was really cool. I sang um, a police song, Sting in the Police, with mm -hmm. her and at that concert that a friend of hers um, had arranged for um, jazz ensemble with with choir, um, and that, that was a really spectacular arrangement. That was, that was really fun. Outside of rehearsals, how do you prepare your um, choir roles at home? Um, I try to listen. To some performances of the of the music if i know there's one especially you know when bob says you know check out this recording of this piece you know it's like okay better write that down because right because yeah. if he likes it then well i you know i better like it too so <laughs> so so that's that's one way and then um you know just if there's something hard you circle it in rehearsal and you go home and, and bang it out on the piano and until it's in your brain and you get it. I, there's no, there's no secret sauce for me. I don't have a, I don't have a magic method. It's just like, well, if I, if I, if I keep missing it, then it's a problem and I need to, to get it in my brain until it sticks. And so. The get, getting it into that muscle memory. Yeah. Right. Or, vo or vocal I mean, something, memory. Some things are sight readable and you, and you show up mm -hmm. and, it, and your brain goes, yeah, that makes sense. I can do that. And then, you know, Bach is a great example of where, you know, a lot of the things make sense and you're kind of going along swimmingly like, yeah, I know how to sing this sort of music. And then all of a sudden he throws a wrench at you and, and your brain explodes. And, uh, and then you have to go work it out <laughs> and try to figure out what he was, what he was doing there. How has your, your voice, your technique, your singing changed since you've been in the choir? Have you noticed anything that, that, that is different now because of singing for Bob for lo these many years? 
Um, yeah, it's hard to know what to attribute to what though, because in the time mm -hmm. I've been in chamber choir, I've also really stepped significantly away from pursuing opera. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, before my time in chamber choir, uh, you know, I was doing the weekly voice lessons and singing arias and there is a way that you sing that music and there's a way that you train yourself to kind of get used to, to sounding and, and all that stuff. And, and in that time, you know, the, the general structure stays the same. It's not like you leave all technique behind as soon as you start singing in a choir, but, but right. you, you approach things differently, or at least I, I certainly do to, to get the sound that I want to hear um, when I'm singing choral music and that I think that Bob is going for, you know, from, from what I know. Um, so it, it feels different. Um, and, and, I, and I think I sound different. I think I have a more um, focused sound. You know, if I, if I listen back to what I sounded like um, back in, you know, grad school, it's, it's not bad. I'm like, okay, yeah, that still sounds like me, but um, I sang with much more vibrato, which was appropriate. But I think, you know, something that I did wrong was that I didn't, I didn't focus on the center of pitch enough within that vibrato and now mm -hmm. because i'm used to singing straight tone more often when i sing solos and reintroduce more vibrato um it's more it's still more focused and there's more there's more center of pitch um when i do it right when I, when i do what i'm trying to do um it i think it's like that and you mentioned singing opera in uh, graduate school when you were at the uh, the Moore School of Music. You sang in some of those Moore's Opera Center productions. What what were some of the roles that uh, that you sang? Um, oh boy, it's been so long, uh, and I have a terrible memory. But um, <laughs> I uh, I think the most fun role that I had there was uh, there was uh, we did. Um, uh, uh, the Barber of Seville mm -hmm. by Rossini, and I'm blanking on the the name of the character, but it's a it's a baritone role, and really you have a, a significant chunk of stage time at the beginning of the opera, and then you're done. So um, <laughs> <laughs> I still I still had to sing in the chorus, you know, on my on my off nights and whatnot for the rest of the show, but but uh, you know for the most part my my buddy that I was um, double cast with. In that show, you know, we would, you know, we'd go out and do the do our part, and then we'd have an hour and a half backstage, like playing cards and whatnot. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of ideal. You go out and you knock it out, and then you're and then you're done. And it's just a fun opera. And um, oh yes, mm -hmm. yeah, it, it's just fun because because you get to be so ridiculous. You know, that that first scene, you know, you're you're on stage. Um, and, and the whole the whole song is piano pianissimo, right? Everybody be very quiet. We're we're sneaking up to the to the count's window or whatever it is. I don't I don't quite remember. I think, yeah, or or he's sneaking up to the to the love interest window because he's gonna serenade her, right? And um, and, but but the 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 group keeps getting excited and 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 it gets increasingly louder until it's you know back to yeah right. exactly. Yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> you know, it's just good old slapstick opera humor. You were born and raised in Alaska. That's right. In Homer, Alaska. Homer, Alaska. Yeah, small, a small, uh, small town. It's f fun fact. I think this is still true that it's uh, the furthest west you can continually drive. In, oh, really? In North America. So if you were to hop in your car right now and you said without getting on a plane or a ferry or anything, I want to drive as far west as I can go, um, you'd go to Homer. Wow. And it would only take you 85 hours to get there. <laughs> <laughs> what was it like growing up sort of on the frontier? Uh, it was a great place to grow up. It was amazing. Uh, it was so beautiful. I mean, which I completely took for granted living there because I lived there from when I was born until I graduated high school. So, and right. you know, for, for context, you should, if, if you're listening to this, you should Google Homer, Alaska, um, just so you kind of, you get the postcard postcard view, because it's insane. I mean, it, it's on a, 
it's on a kind of hill and then there's a bay about you mm -hmm. know five to ten miles across depending on what what point you're at and then mountains across the bay so you have it all right you have the ocean and 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 the mountains um which is just just silly how how, how beautiful it is um right. and so now when i go back it's just my jaw drops every time and um and we never want to leave when when uh, when we go go visit, it's 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 hard to leave because it's so beautiful. But it's it's another world. I mean, it's a town of of five six thousand um, full time residents. Um, so and and the entirety of Alaska only has something like seven hundred and fifty thousand people. So now I live in a oh city. really now I live in a city with almost um, you know ten times as many <laughs> people that, that call it home as as the state, which and and the state is. You know, three times bigger than Texas. So it is, it is very different. Yeah. You left Alaska though to, uh, to go to undergraduate, didn't you? Yeah, so I started working my way south at that point. I, I went to um, the University of Puget Sound in Tacoma, Washington, um, which was fun. You know, small school, 20, 2,600 mm -hmm. students or something like that. Uh, liberal arts, studied music, I um, actually studied voice with a with a, a lady from Houston, named oh, really? um, Dr. Don Padula was her name, and so she was a she um, studied at at University of Houston for her doctoral degree with the teacher that I ended up doing my my master's degree with, um, Joseph Evans, and uh, so yeah, she kind did, did you go straight on to to do your master's degree? I sure did. Yeah, yeah, just. Figured why not keep on chugging along. Yeah. You also did, um, you were a voice major at the University of Houston, but you also did some choral conducting. Um, not really when I was at, at, in school at the University of Houston. I did do uh, um, voice pedagogy um, as a mm -hmm. part of my major where you're, um, you know, kind of diving a little deeper into how all this is structured and, and um, and then ways to talk about it with your students without necessarily bombarding them with all the physiology and instead kind of giving them ways to, you know, which is exactly what my teacher did with me in undergrad because I was I had no idea what I was supposed to be doing. I, I showed up as a freshman not being able to really resonate, you know, um, right. so she had to get all that straightened out. Um, so I and but I did some choral conducting in undergrad. Like I, mm -hmm. I um, you know, I took, took classes and whatnot. And, um, and then kind of after I, I graduated with my master's from UH, I started um, just kind of doing some projects. Like I was, I was doing, I was helping head up a couple projects with um, the Piping Rock Singers, which is a, which is a local group. They have a, a conductor that they normally work with. Um, but uh, there were there were like one or two projects that that we did um, where I was kind of placed at the helm of that, and um, they do a lot of medieval Renaissance stuff, don't they? Medieval and Renaissance, uh, yeah, and, and Renaissance, yeah, exactly. Did you grow up in a musical household? Yes, although not um, not classical music. My my dad no. before I was born. Um, Played in like a folk rock duo. Um, oh, really? Like Homer Alaska. Yeah, he was. You know, he was. He was one of those '60s kids who I think went everywhere with his um, with his guitar. Uh -huh. um, what was the other instrument in the duo? I think it was also guitar. I think they both was, played. Guitar. Oh, really? Uh -huh. I think. Yeah. I mean, I, I never heard them. I, but I think they were done by the time I was I was born, or at least by the time I can remember. Um, okay. But yeah, and he uh, he owned a record shop actually. I think when I was when I was very young. Um, oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. So so yeah, there was a lot of he's he's always, he was always a, a enthusiast of you know listening to music and whatnot. Had, you know, ton of records, ton of CDs, all that. So my childhood, there were many afternoons spent just like kind of pouring in front of the in front of the CD case and like picking things out and and listening to them, just kind of. Like what? Oh, what's this like? Okay, and pop it in. Yes. 
Do you remember what the first music was that that you were really attracted to? That you, when you pulled one of those CDs off out of the case in your dad's store and listened to it, and you said, "Oh my God, this is mind blowing." Well, it's, I mean, it's hard to it's hard to pinpoint because I, I've been listening to music so differently over the years. I mean, I, I remember being a little kid and my mom putting on what is it? Ralphie or something singing ring a ding ding banana phone and 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 loving that I mean I would just sit there and sing along with it or when when Christmas time rolled around I would put on um Nat King's Nat King Cole's Christmas album and listen to mm -hmm. those girls on repeat I think I must have listened to I saw three ships his version of that you know a million times throughout my childhood because I liked it so much but then you know getting getting older um I listened to a lot of Beatles kind of in late elementary school and, and middle school and um, loved that. Uh, and, and then <laughs> for some reason, the, the peer group I was in, in middle school and, and high school, we all really loved classic rock. I'm not really sure mm -hmm. what that was about. It, pu it puzzled our parents so much because they're like, this is the music we listen to. You'd think our kids would want nothing to do with it. But that's that's what we did. We we listened to The Who and Zeppelin and um, yeah, all, all that stuff. And and a lot of us were like in bands and we'd, and we'd play that music and try to like write music that sounded like that music. So I was doing that when I was like 13. Did you, you know? play in a band? Yeah, yeah, we had a, we had a, like one of my very first like solo singing experiences was in, I think seventh grade, I think. And really? there was a school talent show and we played Stairway to Heaven. And, and <laughs> it was so ridiculous. And at that point my voice hadn't dropped yet. Or it was, right. you know, it was just starting. So I could, I could actually sing it, um, and uh, people loved it. I'm sure it was terrible, but, but <laughs> I, I guess for a bunch of twelve year olds, it, it wasn't too bad. And uh, we played that, and I think we played a, a Clapton song, like White Room or something. Um, and and uh, and then my voice dropped, and I became a baritone, and that was a problem because all that music is not for baritones. And so I, I fear I may have hurt myself <laughs> trying to trying to scream like Robert Plant as a as a newfound baritone who couldn't really sing anything above about a, you know, a, a, a middle D um, right. in, my, in my real voice, but I was I was sure trying. So yeah. did you play any instruments in the band? Uh, I was just the, a vocalist. I was the keyboardist. You were the <laughs> keyboardist. Was, so so yeah i was uh, i was simultaneously like the front man and also the least important member of the band depending on depending on what song it was you know <laughs> so you said when your when your voice changed you uh you became a baritone but but now you sing in the bass section so has your voice um matured or um or what? Why? Why do you not sing as a as a tenor? Well, rather than as a as a bass. So so a baritone typically baritones sing in the bass section. Mm -hmm. they, we typically sing bass one. Um, although I I tend to kind of ride on the lower end of baritone. So in choral music I can sometimes sing bass two. Although I don't have the low notes that that some of my friends in the choir choir do. I admire right. that greatly I, I wish i did because it's so cool but but i don't um i'm stuck in the it's stuck in the boring middle land you know the notes everybody <laughs> has it's not, nothing special <laughs> um so but but yeah I'm, I'm far more comfortable singing singing bass than tenor i can swing up every once in a while but i don't want to be there for long it just doesn't it doesn't feel good you know right. it's not comfy so. because when you sing opera of course there are you know, specifically baritone roles, aren't there? Yeah, and, they, and they're often higher, um, which is one reason I think that I'm probably not cut out for opera, at least right now, because um, mm -hmm. that's not where my voice is comfortable. And, and the really interesting thing about opera is um, there, there are light voices, which I, I have a very light voice, 
and and there are light voices that that make it work um, with an opera career, but they tend to be higher. So if you're you know if you're a, a really light baritone, you can sing the role of Debussy's Pelias, for example. Mm -hmm. But that right. has some really high high parts, and I can't do that. Um, I'm yeah. stuck down here. But if you're stuck down here, you're supposed to have a voice like Bryn Terfel, who is probably 260 pounds. And um, I mean, he's just his voice is just gigantic. Um, and now not not everybody who sings in that range is that has a voice that's that big, but you're really supposed to you, those bass notes really have to project and, 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 and fill up in such a dramatic way. And so I kind of discovered that I'm like, well, I have this really light timbre, but I'm, I'm stuck singing down here. And you know what that's really great for? Choral music. <laughs> so. <laughs> so in terms of the music that you listen to today, not the music that you're learning as part of the choir, but for your own enjoyment, what sort of music do you like to listen to? I listen to a, a broad swath of music, most of which is by artists who are working right now. Um, uh, a, a while ago, I had a buddy who was studying jazz trumpet at Idlewild, which is like a, a performing arts high school in California. Um, and he turned me on to some like Israeli jazz players. Um, yeah. And, and it, it was really attractive to me because it was rhythmically aggressive and, and percussive. Um, but, and the, but the harmonies were a little bit more simple. It was maybe a little bit more like um, something like Miles Davis. I mean, he, he, who used some, some really out there harmonies, but there's a lot of modal things and things are a little bit more restrained but with a, a harder rhythmic drive and a lot of like complex time signatures. So he and I used to just like sit around trying to figure out what time signature songs were in because things would just mess with your head. And of course, later we'd realize it was just 4-4 and they were playing polyrhythms and, and accenting odd 16th notes um, the whole time. The whole time somebody's in the back actually laying down 4-4, which is hilarious to realize in retrospect. But, but sometimes, <laughs> you know, they'd be playing in, um, in 11, eight or 13, eight, things like that. And, 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 the, but the beautiful thing about it is it's not, it's not done in such a way that it's like, watch this, we can play in 13, look at us go. They actually are like constructing a melody that is naturally in that time signature and it's beautiful. And if you're not, unless you're trying to like tap your foot along with it, you don't even really notice that anything is weird because it just sounds right. So this yeah. kind of kicked me on a, on a journey of trying to discover more music like this. And in college, I had some friends who were also into it. So um, I listened to uh, some artists from Armenia who are doing um, their version of jazz kind of combined with uh, Armenian folk, which Armenian folk music is beautiful. And all of it's very sad because Armenia has a really tragic History, which a lot of people in this country don't know a whole lot about but if you do you know that it, there's there's been a lot of bad stuff there um and so there's a really um rich folk music tradition that um is very really, really kind of sorrowful and, and beautiful and um but uh one one artist in particular his name is tigran hamasyan and he's he's he grew up as a fan of of death metal and um <laughs> But, but playing piano, he was like a piano prodigy who was a death metal fan um, and who was also, in, but he grew up in a small like rural town in Armenia. So he was really influenced by all that folk music. And somehow he took all these things together and he plays like hardcore alternative jazz, progressive jazz that has a really driving edge and at times sounds like heavy metal, but without any guitars, no screaming, nothing like that but just mm -hmm. the, the, the piano and the bass and the drums sound really heavy, but, but it's mixed in with like really tuneful, beautiful music, all while having a rhythmic structure that I, I can't even comprehend. I mean, it's so complex, um, it's, but it's beautiful. 
it's just once you start trying to figure out what he's doing, your 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 head explodes. Unless you're smarter than I am, I don't know. It's 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 wild. I'm also a huge fan of. Um, there's a young a young guy out of of England named Jacob Collier, who is doing magnificent things that everybody should check out because he uh, he's I, I I think he's the Mozart of our day. I hope I'm not exaggerating. I mean the the things that he's discovering to do in music and how to how to use harmony and different sounds and play in between keys modulating you know slowly b between keys so that he's actually spending time halfway between g and g sharp um hmm. and he can he can hear all these things he he can he can divide you know half steps into 100 in his head and, and hear all of them and he can also divide um, beat percentages in his head. So instead of just being like, I'm going to play straight eights or I'm going to swing, he'll say, well, for this song, I want a 57% swing and, mm. and, uh, and he'll, he'll do it. So it's wild and it's, it's really fun. He's from, a, I guess you might call it a jazz funk background. Is that? What he does? Um, yeah, it's hard to put a pin on it because some songs are more like um, jazz acapella stuff. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, right now he's, he's doing a project where he releases an album every year for four years. Um, it's called Jesse. And every album is different. So the first one was kind of orchestral. Um, he worked with, a, he worked with a, an orchestra actually for, for the album. The mm -hmm. second album was kind of acoustic and a lot of it was actually kind of Gaelic, which was really interesting. And then the third one, which is the last one to have come out, was like pop funk, like electro, electro funk, completely different direction. So, but all of it has his own kind of really heady spin on all those kinds of music. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it, it sounds like you're attracted to a certain complexity in music, a complexity that you can explore. Yeah, I like to be confused. By, by the music that I listen to, I really do. And I, and I think it makes it hard sometimes for me to um, show people music because, and, and I think people think that I'm trying to be really smart because they're like, oh, Patrick thinks he understands this music. And I'm like, no, I don't, I don't. <laughs> I, just, I just enjoy that. I like, I like how confusing it is. You know? Like when I was growing up, uh, you know, my, my first musical choice was classical music, but I remember in my, in my, early mid teens discovering progressive rock and and i you know thought what is it about this music that that i'm so attracted to and i think it was it because of the the complexity of the of the music it was you know it, it mirrored the sort of complexities that i that i enjoyed in in the classical music that i listened to oh absolutely I've, I always had friends who were trying to get me into death metal because they're like, you're a music theory nerd. You need to be listening to XYZ death metal band because these guys all know the theory and they do it. And I'd listen to it and I'd be like, yeah, you're right. This is incredibly complex, but they sound like they're hurting themselves. <laughs> and I, I could never get past that because I was studying voice and it just, uh, yeah, couldn't couldn't get couldn't jump that hurdle, I guess. <laughs> so do you have some favorite death metal bands? I don't. I can't. I can't swing it. So I think that's why I listen to um, Tigger and Hamsian and uh, and and um, uh, there's an album by a, by an Indian drummer named Ranjit Barot, and the album hmm. the album came out almost a decade ago, I think it's called Bada Boom. Um, and, you know, similar sort of thing. I don't know if, I don't know if you, you know, John McLaughlin, but he was, he was really well known for mm -hmm. kind of exploring Indian music in a, in a fusion jazz paradigm, right? So he's a guitarist. Right. This is guitarist, heavy jazz, but, it, but he was obsessed with Indian music. And, and so he, he's on this album. He's not, he's not the band leader for the album, but he, but he's the guitarist on the album um, for most of the songs, I think. Um, he performed a lot with Ravi Shankar, didn't he? Yeah, I think he did. Yeah, and, yeah. and obviously Ravi Shankar was huge in bringing, um, you know, Indian music to the West, and I'm and I'm sure that I'm, I don't I don't know this history, but I can only imagine that 
John McLaughlin was on the receiving end of that, you know, awareness yeah. of, of what's going on in that music. Cause it's, it's just mind blowingly complex. I mean, speaking of time signatures, I mean, the complexity rhythmically is just staggering. So, yeah. You sing, obviously you sing with the, uh, the chamber choir, but you're also the assistant choir director at the Co-Cathedral of the Sacred Heart in downtown Houston. So what does that bring to your musical life? Well, I get to lead something sometimes, you know, mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm, I'm not the boss. I, I report to my, my wonderful boss, um, Dr. Krista Miller, who's the organist there and the director of, of music. Um, but I get to make a lot of decisions and, or, or, you know, if I'm not making the decisions, participating in the decision-making process for the choir. Um, and so at, I, I love that. I like I'm, the control freak part of me gets gets to flex its muscles a little bit, and um, yeah, I love I love directing choir. I love church music. Um, I'm a I'm a big sucker for for Renaissance church music, for um, uh, 20th century English Anglican church music, um, and a lot of stuff in between. Um, and so to kind of have that experience of learning about the liturgical calendar and how this music is is fits into that and what we can do on different days um it's it's really cool and um the great thing about working for a catholic church too is there's this really rich history of chant which is something i didn't used to know a whole lot about and still don't compared to actual Maybe. chant experts but i'm learning um and really cool um to kind of learn how to read and experience a really uh, historic, different different sort of music. I really enjoy that. So. Because the Catholic liturgical tradition obviously is is different from the Anglican. And when we think of, uh, of church music, certainly English church music, we tend to think of, uh, of the Anglican tradition. So have you found, have you found commonalities between the Catholic and the Anglican traditions, or, oh, or are they are they near the twain shall meet, so to speak? Um, no, they're absolutely similar. I mean, uh, the Ang Anglican Church was born just out of a disagreement over marriage, essentially, and, <laughs> and nullification and all that. So, so, and, and and it's developed on its in its own right since then. The Anglican service. It, it, it mirrors the Catholic service essentially yes. all, all the way down. Um, and, and because of that, you know, the, the subject matter of, of the music is very similar. The tradition of how that music is performed is different, you know, so the, mm -hmm. the, the English tradition of choirs of men and boys is not really mirrored in, in Catholicism and the, and the music that's written right. for that. But I mean, that certainly doesn't mean that we can't perform it. And, you know, it also, mm -hmm. <laughs> The Anglican Church certainly also does perform works by the old um, Renaissance and Baroque masters, and they weren't necessarily um, they, they they weren't Anglican. A lot of them were Catholic. You know, Palestrina was sure. writing church for the writing. You know, Bird is is an example of someone who wrote music for for both. Same with Talent, mm -hmm. right? Because they were kind of living in in hiding as as Catholics in in England when things were rather fraught. Um, and, you know, and we all do Bach because nobody's going to, going to turn their nose up at Bach and he was writing for the Lutherans. So, um, so yeah, I think he, there's no reason to turn your back on any of this music. It's all, it's all done in a similar spirit and it's, there's so much good stuff. I mean, why, why would you? I would imagine that from a, a, a choir director standpoint, one of the great blessings, I guess, might be the right word in this context, um, of, uh, of leading the choir at the Co-Cathedral is that you get to fill that tremendous space. And there is a, I don't know what, I don't know what the decay is in the, uh, in the church, but I mean, the, there's just this glorious sound that reverberates around the, the building. It's long. 
it's a long delay. I've been I've been editing some um, some audio files recently to to try to kind of keep up engagement with the congregation and whatnot. Release release things that we've done, and I get to the end of the song, and I'm like, okay, the song's over. Chop, right? You clip it off, <laughs> and then I go back and listen, and I realize that that I chopped it off too early. That the decay the decay was still going. And it's many seconds after the song's ended, and so I have to control Z, control Z, control Z until I until I get the get the whole file back and chop it way over here until everything is actually faded out. It's just insane. And yeah. it's so rewarding to get to make music in that space. Everything from Duraflay, Brahms, big stuff, down to unison, um, uh, Gregorian chant. Uh, it comes back to you in this way that uh, you just want to keep, keep singing forever. It's so much fun. It's so fun. It's great. Well, look, Patrick, I really appreciate you talking to us and, and giving us a sense of uh, the person behind the voice and uh, best wishes for uh, the upcoming Houston Chamber Choir season, however that might pan out, and also for the, uh, the liturgical seasons, the liturgical year at the, uh, the Co-Cathedral. Thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. This has been a real blast. I really enjoyed talking to you. Now you can go and enjoy some of that uh, Armenian jazz funk. I'm going to. I probably will do it while I'm cooking dinner tonight. So Okay. Well, you take care. Thank you very much. Thanks, Indian. And thank you to everyone who supports the Houston Chamber Choir as a sponsor and a patron and who watches the Behind the Music podcasts. We appreciate you supporting us. Thank you very much. I'm Sinjin Flynn, and we'll see you next time. The Houston Chamber Choirs with One Accord is your one-stop shop for choral joy. If you enjoyed this podcast, help us to continue our mission to grow the esteem and appreciation of choral music by sharing, reviewing, and subscribing to our content. As a 501c3 nonprofit, support from listeners like you allows us to continue to create new and exciting programming. For more information about us and how you can support our work, please visit HoustonChamberChoir.org slash give.